podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Chris Prunty. Hello. Gentlemen, on today's episode, we are interviewing, well, to coin a phrase here, he's basically a magic engineer, a uh, imagineer, if you would, if, if <laughs> Disney didn't already steal that from me. Um, oh, God, but... they're coming for us now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. Uh, but on today's episode, we have a very special interview with C.R. Rowinson, and we're going to cut to that now. Today, we are joined by C.R. Rowinson. We're going to be calling him Clark for the interview. Uh, Clark, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. And for those of us who might not know you or your deal or anything like that, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, how much do you want to know, I guess, is the first question. We do have an hour slotted for the podcast and <laughs> at least 15 of it is going to be a world building jam. So that's entirely okay. up to you. Okay. Okay. So we'll skip the really deeply repressed stuff from childhood and we'll just jump straight into recent years. Actually, uh, if so... we want to just focus on the deeply repressed, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's also acceptable. So I can come up during world. Building. I mean, that may be yeah. a more interesting <laughs> episode, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Let's see. So I have a background in chemical engineering and chemistry, and um, I really love writing fiction, RPG stuff. I've been writing for probably over a decade now, but currently what I really focus on is I do freelance developmental editing, writing coaching, and my big obsession really is magic systems. So magic systems for books for comics for video games for tabletop rpgs anything that has a magic system i love talking about it i love building it i love tweaking it and um i'm gonna start a fight right away and say they aren't the same but you can treat magic and technology the same when you're building them that was initially one of the biggest topics when we were you know like reading some of your going over some of your articles is Daniel immediately just was like, well, wait a minute. I immediately <laughs> hold on. And then, and then like pushed up his nerd glasses just a little bit more. Yep. So like, Daniel, why don't we get my nerd hat? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why don't, you, why don't you bust out your, why don't you, why don't you start that way, Daniel? Just go so ahead. I, tell the I would just started. like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want you to, I want you to get, make your, get, cause I've been reading a bunch of your articles. I want you to give us an overview of your approach to um, differentiating between magic and technology, how they are similar because the first, the, the first, um, the first quote that we have from you is magic is anything enabling actions beyond our current understanding or ability. So give us the, the, the skinny on that and how writers can approach um, dealing with magic in their stories. Yeah. So part of that is me being uh, cheap and cheating <laughs> because I was, I wanted to cast a broad net because uh, I, as I started working on this stuff over the years and working, it really kicked off when I started working with people and had to explain my process and help them with theirs. But I started noticing the way we were handling monsters, advanced technology, lost technology, as well as your traditional like nebulous magic system, kind of like Lord of the Rings or something more like uh, Mistborn. It all came down to a lot of the same approach. So I kind of just lumped everything in and, uh, I'm using the term magic because really what it is, is is it's fantastical elements. But if I say that, nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> so magic is anything that is that leap beyond reality where you need people's mm-hmm. buy-in. That's not just the fiction of these events didn't happen, but of no, this isn't real and this can't be real. All of that to me is magic. I like, see. So it's a way of understanding the the kind of the weirdness in stories and then figuring out systems for them. Yeah. To be cheesy, that's the magic of fiction is it's that leap that we're able to take. Cool. Well, yeah, it's edifice, right? Like it's, I I understand it that you're using it more as a shorthand for fantastical devices more than anything Mm -hmm. else. That, that, that makes sense to me. Um, The only thing that I kind of am curious about is that like, where do you differentiate between fantastical technology and genuine magic or, you know, what I would consider like fantastical magic, you know, what's the difference for you or do you really not have, or do you not really not see one? Okay. So there, there is a difference, 
and I know we only have an hour, so the question <laughs> is whether this is the thing we really want to dig, dig into. Because when I say like I'm a nerd about magic systems and I obsess about it, I'm not joking. <laughs> Maybe you can give us, because um, I was reading some articles about yours that that, that covered um, Sanderson's like allomancy, and maybe you can mm-hmm. like give us like an overview of, of how you think about that and how you how you can systematize magic from that perspective. Okay, uh, have you guys read most of the Mistborn books, including the new series with Wax and Wayne? I've read a I good not, portion no. of it. I okay, but so I'm familiar with it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to use that kind of as a baseline. There's a little bit of spoilers there that I can skip if you want, but just because it's nice to... Sh- that series is terrific because it actually... You can see a transition as something is going from more magical to more technological as he goes through his two series, which is really awesome. So the, the short version is I have a number of values and uh, settings, like... I like to think of magic kind of like a a soundboard or even just a a color palette where you're just moving sliders and dials back and forth between settings. And then the overall agglomeration of all of your settings is what determines the overall feel and nature of your magic system. The specifics all come down into the specific effects and the way you present it, but the heart of how your magic system works and feels and compares to others all comes down to these variables. And um, one of them, I know we don't have time to go into all of them, but one of them (laughs) is uh, transference. So transference is everything related to how people gain the power in the first place. Not necessarily where does the power come from, but am am I born with it? Am I trained in it? Or can I, say, pick up a device and then do it? So that, to me, is the difference between magic and technology. Magic, generally, has a lower level of transference. You take original Mistborn, pretty low transference. It's all hereditary. It's um, You get it through genetic lines, through the noble lines, as you learn more about the story. But people don't really have control over which person is going to be born with it or not. You just know, I'm of noble blood. My children might have it. And then once somebody has it, that's it. There's nothing else you can do about it. They're the ones who have it. Nobody else does, with the exception of hemallergy. I know I'm going off on that, but that's a whole side tangent thing. But the point is, <laughs> allomancy itself has low transference. And then when you jump into the Wax and Wayne series, in the third book in the series, uh, Bands of Mourning, which, if you can't tell, fucking love Sanderson. Am I allowed to drop the F-bomb? Where is there a swearing limit? Oh, yeah. I'm fine. Do you mean okay. the fuck word? no i i I fucking love sanderson like as an as a tangent i had been doing um and tangents aren't a problem right hopefully i I edit everything it's fine you're good okay well uh like i've been building magic systems most of my life but it wasn't until i read mistborn that it clicked that i was like oh holy shit people would like the kind of things i'm building um but anyway later in the second series there's a new metal that's discovered that when coupled with sets of metal can temporarily grant people specific magical effects. So they have to imbue the power and you have to have the right people to imbue the power into the object. But once it is, anybody can put it on and use it. And as soon as you have that, you have the ability to transfer specific magical effects to anybody in the world. And then you have the basis for a technological system rather than a magic system. So basically, so you're that's saying. The short so you're so you're saying there's there's basically like a set of variables that fit into like a template. So if you wanted to put together a magic system, it's a matter of going through each of these variables, filling them in, and then you've got something functional. Yeah, yeah, cool. For me, one of the key factors of technology is its high transferability because you have these objects that generate the magical effects and can, in theory, be handed to anybody, and anybody can use them. Uh, but then if you look at something like Stargate, that's technology, but it, especially Stargate Atlantis, but it shifted more towards the middle because then only people with the gene can do it. And then once they develop the gene therapy, it becomes more transferable, but not completely, right? Like my cell phone, I can hand it to anybody and they can make a call with it. Couldn't quite do that with the ancient artifacts from Stargate Atlantis. True. Interesting. 
All right. Yeah. Because my, my brain's going to Star Trek where, you know, it's all techno babble and all that. But at the same time, like as long as you see it as something that can be. You- so so how do you feel about magic items then? Sanderson would seem to be like it's not magic. It's not technology, but magical items. But do you see magic as just another power source then for advanced technology? It can be. So that gets into some of the other variables that, again, I'm not going to jump into all the details, but there, there's the transference. And then there's um, there's one I just think of as use and abuse, and that relates a lot to scalability. So you can use, once you have transference, uh, the ability to transfer magical effects and magical abilities, whether it is truly technology or not, you can treat it like technology in your world, world building. You can start building industries off it. You can start pr- churning out these objects and distributing them. The level of magic versus technology uh, so the um, the other aspect of transference and um, use and abuse will dictate how much it can be scaled up. In Mistborn, specific people have to imbue the items, so they are revered. They are um, like they're going to be rich. They are the people in power in the society because they are the ones who can generate this immensely useful technology. If people have a high enough knowledge or which is another one sorry i'm just throwing these out left and right but if you have enough knowledge of how things work then you can take it out of the hands of specialists and start putting it in the hands of everyday people at which point everyday people can start mass producing this uh, mass producing this item that can be used by anybody and you now have something that can be a widespread common piece of technology or magic throughout your world You'll, you'll have to excuse me, but I can't help but read that as, um, you know, a, as a sort of leftist movement, you know, where you're actually literally taking the means of production and giving them to, you know, the common people. Like I, I'm like I said, I'm not familiar with the Mistborn series. I've heard it's very good, but I've actually just never read it. Uh, is that is that kind of a theme that's in those books or is that something that is perhaps I'm going? A not really. With? And. So uh, I'll, I'll go back to D&D, right? So D&D, you have specific people that can be trained up to do enchanting and, uh, and alchemy, right? Those mm-hmm. items can be used by anybody. So once they're created, the transference of those items is extremely high. Or like uh, your god hearts. Once they turn the god heart into an artifact, the transference of the abilities granted by that artifact is extremely high. But the ability to create it is extremely low. So mm-hmm. if you then made it mm-hmm. so the ability to create more was easier to do, then you would be able to start mass producing. So if instead of it needing to be sorcerers and enchanters and uh, and wizards who built these specialty items, as soon as more people are able to do it, you can really step up how much it's done. Or if you can make it so they can do it in larger and larger batches, that would also kind of make it more of a technology rather than just um, magic. So again, it goes back to the transference because um, building technology off of magic at its heart, it has something with zero transference and you are making mm-hmm. it more like technology by creating a way to hand it off to people. True technology is 100% transferable all the way to the core where if you have the knowledge and you have the materials, anybody can build it. See. You, you say that you're uh, like nerding out about this shit, but I'm loving this conversation right now. Like I'm like, yes, like I, I, you can't see me, but I have, I literally have my, my fingers steepled, like, mm, mm, re- really enjoying that conversation. <laughs> Are your nerd glasses yeah. on Rob? Oh, very much so. And a hat. I got the <laughs> hat too. I had that too good. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you had a well, question. That's good, Cause I can go for hours. <laughs> <laughs> when when you're also talking about the uh, the transference of power and everything, uh, once again to go back to the Mistborn uh, with shard plate and uh, the shards themselves, would you still view that as transference in the fact that only certain people have them, but anyone can technically own one, and in a sense getting one uh, for feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but is also kind of unlocking more potential within the person. So the ability to hand it off is the transference. That's the transferability. Technically, anybody can take a shard blade or a shard plate and bond to it. In fact, that's, that's a big part of 
Kaladin's arc and about uh, some of the stuff in the world is all of these legends of people from the lower caste ascending to the higher caste because they earned some of this special gear. Um, so there, the abilities can be transferred to anybody. Uh, the uh, transference is not the same as rarity. Rarity ties into prevalence, uh, which is another variable. Like we made we. <laughs> Man, if you guys keep this up, I may just need to actually pull up my list and just go through it. <laughs> uh, but uh, prevalence is what determines how often you see it. So extremely high prevalence, you know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting that type of magic. Um, shard plate is pretty low prevalence because they're extremely rare. They are treasures of families and nations. So as soon as that, prev as soon as that prevalence started going up, and that's the other part of technology. When it's a common item, it's going to be high prevalence, high transference. So if, if they were able to mass produce shard plate, all of a sudden you have a um, high production, high prevalence, high transference item that can be the foundation for a rapidly expanding empire. In your, in your article, um, the seven global variables, um, you mention um, magic flux. And I just wanted to make sure we have a chance to bring in your chemical engineering background because that one was really interesting to me um, because it's something I wouldn't have thought of given that I have no science background. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about those variables and what how those um, could enhance a magic system if you're building one? Yeah, yeah. And while, while we're on that, I do need to come clean because I've... Uh, as I'm working this process and working with people, I'm rediscovering stuff and some things have finally clicked in. So that post on the seven global variables isn't quite right anymore. Uh, the, the biggest one is I no longer see them as separate sets of variables. It's one long list that you want to consider at different levels, right. global being one of the levels. But um, yeah, magic flux that came from yeah the, the chemical engineering heat and mass transfer because um, flux is just the movement of something in or out of a defined system. And with that, that gives you a lot of potential to explore some fun changes and dynamics that can happen in your story and in your world. So if you have a positive flux, that means the amount of whatever inside your predefined system is increasing. Negative means it's decreasing. Neutral means that it is staying the same. That doesn't mean nothing is coming in or leaving. It just means the amount coming in is equal to the amount going out, which can be a lot or it can be nothing. Um, what would be like an example of that? Like if you were to th make up a system really quick. A good example of positive flux would be mm -hmm. like the Marvel Universe, honestly. Because as they go with every passing year, more and more of these extraordinary people are showing up and are getting involved. Oh, so mm -hmm. the scale and the an amount of power is rapidly growing as you continue through the saga. Um, decreasing is a harder one because usually people like to stack on the magic rather than take it away. Mm -hmm. so would that be like, um, say, in Lord of the Rings, like the, the, um, yeah. the wizards, that there's only so mm -hmm. many of them, they can die and that's it? Yeah, and that the elves are leaving and they're taking their magic with them uh, and okay. just the lands are slowly becoming less magical. Yeah, that's a great example. Uh, and then neutral is pretty much anything where it stays the same. But like I said, since it's a since it's a defined system, you can set those lines wherever you, you want. So when you're considering flux, you can be thinking of the from the perspective of your character, from the perspective of your story arc in your novel, or the perspective from your entire world. So like um, if you have a character who is continuing to grow in power, like Harry Dresden, as he goes through the books, he is having an overall positive flux. And we as readers are having an overall positive flux as we see more and more of the supernatural world. Now, it could be, I, I don't know, I don't know what's in Jim Butcher's head, but if <laughs> uh, magic is actually fading from the world, that's a really interesting situation where for the reader and for the character, it's positive. But for the universe, it's actually negative. It's, what I, I really, love splitting hairs and looking at all these complex details. So, what I really love about this kind of thinking is that you know when you when you're approaching a blank page and you're trying to write something and you're like, I have this magical effect I have in mind, right? Or I have this, 
you know, a magic item and you're like, well, where do I even begin? You know, even reading, reading through your articles, I'm like, hmm, this is actually really helpful if I was trying to flesh out a system because all I need to do is look at each of these variables and figure out which ones are important to me and then just fill them out. And I suddenly have something that functions. It's even just the concept of magic flux tells us a lot about the world. So I think that's really neat. Hmm. Thanks. You're... Yeah, and that that's part of my intent. Blueprint, that's the word I couldn't think of before. It, is I've been exactly. working for several years now to try and create a blueprint that people can just work off of rather than these long lists of very open-ended questions that are hard to answer if you don't already know your answer. It's like Save the Cat, but for um, magic, which Save the Cat is like a plot me plot um, deriving mechanism we use in writing. But you gotta, well, you got to give it a name like Save the Cat, and I think this would be like essential to every story building process. One thing I'm always fascinated by is people's backgrounds and you having, you know, a chemical engineering background totally makes sense to me now. Like hey, listening to you talk to talk about magic is, is very, I imagine like you in like a steampunk universe explaining how magic works is totally <laughs> like in my, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's, that's just how it works. I totally understand that. Uh, what else in your background would you say has influenced your kind of love of magic and fantasy in the way that you kind of approach world building? Oh, that is a big question. Um, let's see. The time I spent in science was definitely a big thing. Obviously, I uh, spent most of my life reading. Um, so long time I, I just read fantasy and I really had to push myself to open up into, uh, into sci-fi and some of that stuff but uh i guess really the standards unless you want to talk about like specific inspirations but um novels video games and tabletop rpg stuff especially tabletop rpg stuff once i started discovering um different setting campaign setting guides and stuff like that where it's like oh this is just a work a book of nothing but world building yes uh, i i really that is a severely underrated gateway into the hobby, I think, is once your brain starts clicking of like, wait, you can have this setting and you can have this setting with this, like you're, you're, you're good to go. Like, I don't care about anything else. I just want to build whatever I think is most interesting. Yeah. Mm. What was your first, what was your first RPG? What was your first setting? Uh, so first game I played was uh, just a standard D and D three point five that I played with my friends in their basement, um, and that that was in high school. I didn't, and then I played some more three point five in college, and then I've just kind of been expanding and exploring and looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. And I started GMing about two years ago now, which was a which was a big jump, but um, yeah, there's so many good systems out there right now. I've been so I, I run using a system called Open Legend, which I freaking love, um, which I don't need to go into all of the details about that right now. But it's a cool system and it's open source and you should check it out. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, in, in your in your in your background, um, I noticed that you were involved with some interactive murder mysteries. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Can you tell us about that. Yeah. So. When I got out to California, I made it, that was when I, that was a year or so after I had really gotten serious about my fiction writing. And I came out here, I looked for some local writing groups, joined in and started hitting it off with some of the people out here. One of them was a really big theater guy that did fiction and had done some of the inter these interactive uh, stories before. So he and I kind of teamed up because he liked how off the wall and creepy a lot a lot of my stuff was that he had read so they went from a lot more light i don't want to say light hearted light hearted but uh he did more like agatha christie style murder mysteries and then mine were a lot more like grim grim monster murder mysteries so mm -hmm. we had one where it was a bunch of people who got trapped in the desert and died because of a cave-in and you had to figure out where the murder happened with this cold case from three years ago. Oh, um, neat. Yeah, stuff like that. Uh, How did that influence like your thinking as a as you start to do GMing and as you start to think about RPGs and magic systems? So for me, <laughs> magic systems have kind of been the gateway into everything for me into uh, 
into reading fiction, into video games, into RPG stuff. That's really been, and, and even world building, that point where I start to see like, oh, this has this has a huge connection to this or a lot of room to play out over here. That's where I really start to get into it. Um, the murder mysteries really helped me focus on uh, audience knowledge as opposed to character or personal knowledge. Because that's one thing mm. when I'm, when I'm coaching writers and I'm helping with some of their stories, that's one of the big things you see is they have stuff in their head that they didn't put on the page and then it makes it confusing. And same thing with uh, when I'm GMing, I have to make sure that I actually deliver the information that I need them to know. Um, but at the same time, it's really helped me understand when by holding back just a single sentence, I can start to build up some tension and I'm not going to say I'm great at it, but I have a lot of fun doing that to my players. They may hate <laughs> me for it. I don't know. Uh, I had a question of what are like, what is the time that you've seen either like a magic system or in sci-fi, uh, a light magic system that's upset you, like a pet peeve or something that uh, you can recall seeing? Okay, uh, this might upset a lot of people because uh, I know it's a very popular series. Do it, but do it. the Night Angel series by Brent Weeks upsets me a lot. What about it? Um, part of it is it's kind of an extension of what I didn't like about most of the book. Uh, is it? It felt extremely fan service. It didn't feel like there was a reason for stuff. It felt like oh, they need to have illusions and shape shifting and telekinesis and magic poisons oh and healing and there's got to be fireballs it was kind of just like i'm gonna throw everything in just because it's cool and that's it and then i'm not gonna try and tie them together it's just it is this it is magic there you go um that that really upset me <laughs> the wizard did it kind of thing yeah yeah that that in general really upsets me um when it's done wrong, because you can you can do that right, but it's really easy to do wrong. Um, if you haven't read it, if you want a really good example of a of a soft magic system where things aren't really explained and they solve a lot of big problems with magic, but it still feels okay, Uprooted by Naomi Novik is fantastic. Because there, the wizards all have their own style and they're randomly using spells to solve what would be pretty big problems but she does such a good job that it never actually solves the major plot so even when they solve something that could have been a major hurdle it doesn't feel like it you don't feel robbed but yeah if i feel you're robbing me of tension or experience or um or anything really just because you wanted you wanted your telekinetic assassin in the story i'm gonna be upset i suppose that that kind of leads me to my next question, which is where do you see the difference between bad writing and bad world and bad world building? Or, or are they synonymous to you? That is a very good question. So I, I love world building. Um, I'm going to be honest though. It's not until the last couple years that I've really expanded my start. I have been intentionally expanding my capabilities beyond just the magic system. Uh, so I'm still learning a lot about all the world building, which is why I found this podcast and why I love it so much. Um, mm. There is there is so much in writing that just comes down to the presentation. Um, I, I feel like there's some pithy quote somewhere that would relate to this. They can both ruin each other. And when either one of them is bad, it can be hard to tell which it is. A good writer with a really bad with a really bad magic system can pull it off, but it's still not going to feel right. And a really bad writer with a really awesome magic system, I'm not going to care about the story. Like they can ruin each other. <sighs> why? Why am? I, why is Tolkien coming to mind? Right oh, now? screw you! <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question about that, though. Um, like it's it seems too that this is it, it's more important to have that balance between world building, good world building, and good writing um, in genre in particular. Like I, it's definitely true in all writing because there's always world building to do, but it's really crucial I think in, in genre because 
part part of the pre- like part of the promise to the re- to the reader in genre is that you're going to give them a new world. So if you screw up the one, you're really screwing up half the job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've I've always talked about how important like or or why I believe like in literature specifically why genre fiction is always kind of looked looked down upon. And I've always thought that it has a lot to do with the amount of words that writers have to use in order to explain the fantastical elements within their world. Mm -hmm. Because we all know what an oak tree is. We all know what Florida is, unfortunately. You know, (laughs) like we don't need to spend half of a page or a couple of paragraphs explaining, you know, the Republic of Florida or what an oak tree is, because that's common knowledge. We that's that's assumed knowledge. Whereas yeah. with, with fantasy worlds and with sci-fi worlds, like we have to explain that because, oh wait, why the fuck did that? That's bad writing, right? Like when we're asking, what the fuck is that? How does that work? Where does that, unless it's Dahlgren, right? Like <laughs> right, where nothing, anything goes. <laughs> exactly. Like, unless it's like uh, it, uh, obtuse for a reason, like we, that's just considered bad writing. And so you lack a lot of the depth through some, you know, symbolism and everything like that when, mm-hmm our symbolism isn't the same as a fantastical world symbolism. Yeah. I, I just always attack that because it's like, man, that's, that's why genre fiction is, it can be way better than a lot of, you know, very serious fiction, Off the shelf but, literary fiction. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes it's poo pooed simply because you have to do a little bit more, you know, legwork. And that's why, uh, again, why you see thousand page books, of, of fantasy and significantly less thousand page books when it comes to a modern drama setting type deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sorry. My rant over. The... <laughs> I, I have to get that off my chest ever. It, like every time I hear it, I'm like, God damn it. Genre fiction. Sorry. Oh, continue. No. no, you're absolutely right. And, and like cutting down on the number of words you use in your story is one of the most difficult, but one of the most rewarding things that I have found in my writing and working with other people. Because I know when I'm forced to take a paragraph of, um, if I'm forced to take 100 words down to 90 or 80, it always ends up better. Because I have to really dig deep and I really have to work on finding a better way to explain it or just removing unnecessary elements. Um, But yeah, and and yeah, you you have to have both. Like, um, (laughs) again, magic is how I got into writing because I first started was making these big elaborate intricate magic systems which are in my opinion still super cool and i still plan to put them in some fiction novels eventually but uh, i was i would just spend hours talking to my friends about it and eventually they said clark shut up just shut up (laughs) write it down and we'll read it i'm tired of listening about listening to you talk about it just write it down and i'll read it so i wrote it down and then they didn't read it so (laughs) in my head i was like you know what (laughs) I'll put it in a story and then they'll want this extra info information, those jerks. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's how I got Trojan horse it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I had, I had a question on the same subject matter there in terms of editing and working with writers um, and generally being someone who has some like market themselves. I think this is important to indie, indie RPG creators as well as, um, you know, aspiring authors. Um, and you also mentioned in another interview, um, I, I think you were talking about 20 books, 50 K is that the convention that you had gone to? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I'm familiar with that one. So 20 books, 50 K is a, um, it's a Facebook group and a convention about writing 20 books, self-publishing them to earn 50 K a year and getting, keeping them in circulation. Um, and it requires a lot of ambition and a lot of planning and marketing. So what I would ask you having been to that convention, you know, having done your own podcast, working on these mystery, um, interactive murder mysteries, you know, got your blog going, how do you keep all the pots boiling and how do you, um, you know, like what is your advice for people who are trying to have that hustle? I wish I had a magic bullet. I really don't, um, because my answer to trying to keep all of the pots boiling is I took a bunch of them off the stove. Uh, (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, because for a while I was running my blog where I was posting once every two weeks. And if you guys have seen the articles, those aren't those aren't short articles. (laughs) So they they take a good chunk of time for me to write. And I was doing the podcast. I was trying to do fiction and I was also trying to write nonfiction and I was just losing my mind and making no progress on any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so I, I had to make the personal call to really focus in. And that's why right now I'm actually really focused on my nonfiction. Um, for, oh, interesting. Yeah, for, for a couple of reasons. One of the big ones, as you mentioned, Save the Cat. Uh, which mm -hmm. I love. And if also, if you guys aren't familiar with KM Wyland, she has amazing stuff on story structure and, um, and plotting, but there's a lot of stuff out there already for story structure and character design and character arcs and, and all that kind of stuff. I couldn't find really anything besides Sanderson's laws about how to build magic systems. Mm -hmm. So I made kind of a judgment call saying like, well, this seems like a niche that is being unaddressed and I think I can address it. And that's where I've really been focusing in for the last couple of years. Um, we'll see how well that works out in the long run, but that was part of it was, was really focusing in on that. I think we're really approaching um, a point where we can actually kind of treat genre fiction and, you know, in your case, magic specifically with a lot more seriousness, which I actually really respect. I think that we're finally realizing that we can make these stories better through study and you know process and everything like that it doesn't have uh, to I, I be just that, instinct anymore absolutely absolutely i mean uh sand it, it's crazy to me that sanderson was the first it, it gets credit for being like the laws of magic and right. like how long has genre fiction <laughs> been a fucking thing for and sanderson is the first one like, are you kidding? Uh, that's ridiculous. And his, his <laughs> principles are sound, but they're just, they're pretty, you know, standard thinking for, for yeah. writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and, and to go back to your question about the pot spoiling, like. Yes. Because again, no, I don't, I don't have a magic bullet. Just, I can just tell you my approach. Because the other part of that is I'm in a fortunate enough position that I can afford to carry out carry on with my writing work on the side and have and maintain a stable and healthy life so i don't i don't need my side hustle to kick off and i know that's not always the case for some people i know i'm very fortunate to have that and i am abusing the shit out of that i'm gonna <laughs> ride that until success does tip over and i can jump yeah. and not a second before but that's my approach and because i'm pretty risk averse so you know um, not the kind of advice I usually hear from people, but that's how I'm trying to handle this stuff. Well, I'm looking forward to you producing a book on, or finishing the book I always have on your website about um, magic systems, because that would be a great one for genre readers and writers to pick up. Yeah, Absolutely. and actually, uh, since you mentioned it, <laughs> the the workbook is actually going to be published at the beginning of September on Amazon. It'll oh, wow. be available on Amazon. Yeah. So oh, great. I'm real excited wow. about that. Cool. Uh, I'll be using it, that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. And with that, we are just about approaching the time where we get to do a world build jam. Already? Now, Man, for those I'm of you who so don't... much fun ranting. <laughs> <laughs> Goes fast. I, to, to be fair, I was having a lot of fun listening to your rant, so that's yeah. totally acceptable. Yes. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know how this works, we're basically going to roll some dice and spontaneously create some kind of a scenario based on those random dice rolls. Now, the first thing we roll for is the genre, whether that be between science fiction, fantasy, horror, modern day, romance, or a combination of the two. Next, we find the subject, whether it be an item, a monster, a place, a historical figure, an event, or some combination of those. And then finally, well, not finally, but <laughs> next we have the theme between madness, sacrifice, love, metamorphosis, pride and honor, this, the unspeakable, triumph and hope. And then once we've done all of that, we go ahead and fuck it up with a twist. And I have too many twists to name, so I'm not going to name them all. But as our guest of honor, Clark, why don't you go ahead and start us off as soon as I roll these dice? Bring it on. All right. So, I'm going to move the microphone so it gets a nice Foley effect. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. First up is the genre. We're doing modern day. 
Ooh. And next Ooh. we have the subject, which is roll two and combine them. So oh I'm going to roll some dice again. Uh, we have a monster and a historical figure. <laughs> that makes sense. That's interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Another Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> uh, yeah, fighting the Sasquatch. That's where my brain immediately goes. All right. Oh, you can't plant that in there. Now everyone's thinking about Teddy. Uh, t- to be fair, everyone should be thinking about Teddy Roosevelt all Their the dreams. time. Yeah. yeah. Next, and almost penultimately, we have the theme, which is pride and honor. So with a modern day genre, a monster, a historical figure, and a theme of pride and honor. Clark, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Okay. Well, modern day, like nothing nothing new or creative about this, but modern day that my brain immediately jumps to urban fantasy or something that is slewing away from urban fantasy by being a little more common. Mm-hmm. Historical figure and monster. So... Not quite sure how the theme works in, but I've I've always loved uh, Digimon, and if you guys have read Codex Alera uh, by Jim Butcher, um, just uh, the idea of somebody bonding with a monster and forging that connection. So mm-hmm. I want to tell a story where we have somebody in modern day who has gone out into the wilds and has been the first person ever to bond with a wild monster. Oh. I love that so much already, especially the Digimon yeah. reference, because Digimon is severely underrated. Agreed. Uh, yeah. It, it, and not only that, tells better stories than Pokemon almost every single time. Uh, so here's, a, here's a question. Um, is the, why is it, why is, is this person the first person to bond with these monsters? Are these monsters like very difficult or unruly? Like, are they, um, they're like Kaiju kind of creatures? And so it's like, what the heck? How did you bond with it sort of thing? We could decide that. I know that's yeah. that's that's an ask. Yeah, I'm actually thinking that it should had has something to do with the theme that we're dealing with, which mm-hmm. is pride and honor. Whether or not we want about. it to, yeah, whether or not we want it to be something, you know, that's fairly simple. Whether it be this human is the first human to follow the code. Uh, this is the first one to prove itself that it has the oh, honor to the monster. And, I see. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, first okay. person to earn the respect of the monster. So it's like a dragon. It's probably like intelligent in some way, or it's like, you know, known well, for being pretty close to dragon like. or anything. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I, I want to stay away from dragons just because yeah. I feel like the dragon rider is fairly cliche. It's so obvious. let's yeah. Yeah, it's it's too obvious, in fact. I agree. Yeah. So let's go ahead and figure something else out. Something ridiculous that you wouldn't so, expect to desire honor. <laughs> so if if the kind of what my brain is drifting to now is if the monsters are just creatures that have been warped and part of that warping is they gain higher levels of intelligence then Mm -hmm. each monster would have its own version of honor and what it is proud about right so maybe it's just flattery right it it goes up to uh (laughs) um oh shoot what are what are the birds that hercules fought that had the the wings that could cut down trees Go up to one of those and you just compliment it on the roster of its feathers. And it's like, oh, I like you. (laughs) Mm. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So that actually makes a lot of sense if we're doing with like, so you're, you're appealing to the monster's pride in order to prove your own honor. So now we, we, you know, get that double whammy there. Okay. So let's, let's name the monster. Let's figure out like what, like I imagine that there is a whole, array of monsters but what's the first monster that is bonded to with this historical figure side note the birds were called symphalian symphalians very important daniel thank very you important <laughs> I had or it is i mean we can go with symphonax Ooh. all right all right all right oh, so are they oh. sphinx like I, idea so uh, going back to the pride and otter honor otter pride and otter completely different subject uh, it's an otter monster. To... Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, we're doing you... we're doing otter monster, boys. 
that's, that's it. <laughs> that's such little hands. Actually, yeah. Let's let's do a giant otter that has the height of the Nimian lion. I'm I'm actually down for that. <laughs> oh, that's dope. Uh, yeah. Let's uh-huh. let's and do they, that. They're still cute though. Can they still be kind of cute? You know, little oh, hands absolutely. and they like building stuff. Well, the hands are really good. That's why it's terrifying. It's this giant, adorable otter that is just taking mortar shells to the side and not, (laughs) not doing anything. Uh, But uh, okay, so so we have the otter. But my thought was, you have to get them to pay attention to you by appealing to their pride. But maybe there's actually a compact, kind of like with warlocks and demons, and then throughout there, both parties have to honor the contract. Otherwise, Mm. the bond could break, and they would both lose any benefits that they had. That's great. That's so amazing. they're mischievous then in some way, or like devious. They could be. I mean, you could also make it more positive. Like maybe bonding with humans gives them a higher level of intelligence and different forms of thought and memory, which would be something that would mm. be really advantageous. It's like, I don't want to, like I was smarter than your average otter, but I don't want to go back to that. Oh, I see. <laughs> Does the human then become more like primal in a sense, or more in touch with uh, the instincts of uh himself or themselves I mean, we could go so many different ways it could just be that you have this uh nimian otter mount that you ride around across the oceans or maybe some of the powers of the creature do get bestowed on the uh on the human as well i don't know both would be cool yeah let's let's talk a little bit more about this historical figure then like it's the first person to ever do this what about this person is special? You know, like, are they the president of the United States? Are they stop? Just, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like, is is this like maybe is it Jack Hanna? You know, like, why is this person the first person to be able to create this bond where everyone else has failed? Mm-hmm. You know what I want, which you guys can jump in. It doesn't have to be uh, Clark Hour. Just give him what he wants. Uh, but what if this was like a Jane Goodall type character? Oh, okay. I like that. Mm-hmm. This was somebody who like went out and they were the first ones to understand and they had been promoting like these are more than just animals and we can't treat them like animals. Who's our modern day Jane Goodall figure? I think it's still Jane Goodall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah just thinking with Jane her? Goodall. I'm down for that. That's <laughs> awesome. That's still modern day. Come on, you can't. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I, I think that uh, I like that idea a lot, actually. This person. Or Steve Irwin. Oh, Steve well, Irwin. Yeah. He, this was the secret. This was the secret chronicles of Steve Irwin that we didn't know about. So was I supposed to pick somebody who was a prominent figure in history? I had been going. No, the not at all. They did this thing, no. so they become a host, historical figure. It's totally no. up to you. you okay. Yeah, you can you can use it as this. This is the reason this person is a historical figure is because they were the first one to do it. Mm-hmm. I do think totally it should be acceptable. Jane Goodall with a giant otter. <laughs> <laughs> so a jane goodall adjacent his figure in modern day has discovered a way to make a bond with these giant otters that have appeared in the world because of some transformation that's happened to them that's where we're at right now right mm-hmm. we can always blame global warming i feel like or oh, i'm sorry <laughs> climate change Why yeah. because i feel blame? like that is that is probably working with the themes that we're already you know kind of going with here so a bond with nature when, mm. you know, we kind of need it. I can see how that would be important right now. Well, and because I love horror, it would be easy to tie in some sort of um, eldritch fashion where we were experimenting with things we weren't supposed to. Um, yes. And, Ooh, bring and in the Mariana Trench. And some kind of ripple effect. More. More. We need more otters. Oh, if you actually <laughs> wanted to get away from the... Uh... The whole like to go with the climate change kind of thing you could have that maybe also society is going against nature because it's also monstrous in its abilities so there's people who are just like no clear cut the forest it's filled with monsters (laughs) or you could go the whole route where it's the earth trying to respond to us so it's creating these creatures in order to put us back in check are the otters not the only kind of, of giant monsters out there? Oh, are they no, the only they ones can't we can be bond the only with? Kind. <laughs> of course <laughs> they're not the only kind. Come on. No, no. That, no, it's just otters. It's always just been lots, otters. Lots of ocean otters. <laughs> otters all the way down, apparently. They will uh, destroy us with their cuteness and the clams on their stomachs. What's the predator of the otters? Okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> We're getting too much in the weeds here. We still have a fucking twist we gotta throw in, you guys. All right, before that comes in... We're gonna. I'm gonna roll this d12. I'm gonna see what this says. It 
guys, there's no twist. What? <laughs> what is there's it? There's no what twist. Say? That's the twist. That there's no twist. <laughs> that's the twist. <laughs> yes. Why is that a twist option? <laughs> that no, that's actually not. <laughs> I don't... Can we re-roll that? Are you sure that it wasn't something about dwarves and you're just not? Yeah, it must no. be dwarves because he no, hates no, no, no. them. The, the actual twist is that there's no twist. That is the twist. What? Okay. Son yes. of a bitch. I don't like yeah. it. Well, you don't have to like it, Daniel. I'm not trying to please you. It's bittersweet. <laughs> I'm appealing to the list, God damn it. I feel like, I feel like CRO is cheated. we already have a cheated. cool concept. <laughs> exactly. Also, if you don't like the list, you should contribute to it instead of having me do all the work. <laughs> it was a group list. Oh, you added one? I've added more and you've deleted them. Because they're bad <laughs> ideas. Keep adding dwarves, Chris. Go add like 12 dwarf situations. I've tried uh, hiding it and saying in sky, little people. Uh, or dwarves and trees. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, so... Without the twist, let's go ahead and figure out what is the predator of these otters. Well, I guess a giant really... beast. What's that? The predator of these giant beasts. Yeah. Because it's not just otters, right? Right. Right. Well, I mean, I I'm, guess well, part I mean, of... No, because if that's the case, then humanity is the obvious... Like, maybe, maybe that's the thing, is that... There is a clash, and the reason that the first person to bond is because it's a matter of no one has ever bothered to or thought to because it's, oh, shit, these things are ravenous, horrible beasts, and we're getting murdered by them. And then this Jane Goodall type is like, okay, well, uh, we're going to try and study them first. Mm -hmm. So you're saying man, to some degree, is really the predator. So Obviously. Or, or what if it's just um, – so if I was doing – if I was building this as a magic system, this would be a good point to figure out like where the origin actually is. So we have a pseudo global warming thing caused by our own pride and hubris. And depending on how that kicked off, we could just pick a whole bunch of stuff from the area. Um, oh. And all of that stuff could be kind of the, the, the eye of the hurricane where that's where all of the stuff starts. And then it spreads out from there. Hmm. Ooh, so, like maybe there's like a, a like a, a big another big spill that's like involves like I don't know nuclear material to be like cliched or something as the yeah. origin point. Well, see, I, mean, I was actually thinking that everything's buried underneath the ice. You know, ooh. like you know, it, these these old these ancient creatures are being awakened. Because oh, okay. The ice oh, age I see. Okay, over. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I, you're you're saying yeah. literal global warming. I had been thinking yeah. like a a magical global warming, which is changing <laughs> oh. changing things on the globe, but. I, I don't mean, know. My, why not my gut both, instinct, but, because yeah. it's horrifying to me, is some sort of monstrous saltwater crocodile, and those things are already terrifying as it is. So, oh, old dinosaurs! Can we break? They're they're dinosaurs <laughs> that have been preserved. Yes. Nobody's excited about dinosaurs. <laughs> Damn you all! All of you. As I, long as they mean? can be, I, I I just want to go fantastical with them. That's my only request. <laughs> oh, I mean, if you go uh, add magic to dinosaurs, you're, you're very close to dragons. <laughs> just don't give them fire true. don't give them fire give them other magic <laughs> I, you know i have to agree with that i've always thought that uh fire breathing dragons are by far the lamest of the dragons mm -hmm. like lightning. why not I, yeah lightning is always the coolest one for me I've, I've always thought lightning dragons are the fucking coolest molten gold would be cool oh that's a good one that yeah. I can, it's a very I can expensive that. dragon oh yes. <laughs> okay, All so, right. okay so what if actually parasites i have uh been magically enhanced too so you have a couple major species but the real problem is the parasites and the bacteria and stuff that have been supercharged hey that's a great Ooh. idea that's not and and you can have like uh an antagonistic force with that that's somewhat intelligent as well oh uh what you could also do with the parasites and everything uh and the melting of the ice caps is you could have something that's a parallel to the thing that is taking over a bunch of this uh megafauna and like attack or meta megafauna or flora yes. megafauna megafauna yeah meat moss hell yeah oh god yes <laughs> yes that's the title of this episode meat moss, meat moss? <laughs> yeah we went from uh, cute otters to meat moss <laughs> yeah well, one of the classics for this kind of thing is going with that um cordyceps fungus that messes with the ants oh um yeah that's but that's i do like one. the idea of doing some kind of of creature like the thing where it's some 
evolved parasite that is just invading the nervous system of creatures. Mm. All right. I, I don't, I think we can end on meat moss. I think that's, I think yeah. that's a really good place to stop. Uh, <laughs> and moss, that, hell yeah. Full stop. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. And with that, that brings us to the rapid fire question portion of the podcast. All right. So Clark, my wife wants to know, is cereal a soup? It is a soup. And I, I want her to tell me if calzones are a sandwich or a casserole. Cause I don't know. <gasps> Counterattack. Mm. All right. I, I appreciate that. Uh, what have you been playing recently? I've been playing darkest dungeon, darkest dungeon and pillars of eternity. Oh, oh, I love Pillars. I I love Darkest Dungeon. I love the, hate Darkest Dungeon. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's, that's correct. The that's how Darkest Dungeon really wants you to feel about it. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> All right, and uh, plug somebody who isn't you. Do I have time to do two real quick? Is that yes? Because one is I I really really want to plug Open Legend. Uh, it's open source role playing game. It's really awesome. I think it's brilliant because of how they handle the magical effects. They make it so that you can reskin it a hundred different ways, super easy. And because it's all open source, that means anybody, any aspiring like RPG creators, you can go and you can grab it. You can build your own stuff and you don't have to worry about intellectual property or anything like that. They're really big about being, it being open and using it to create new stuff. So I highly recommend Open Legend. Uh, another one is a good world building resource, um, World Builders Anvil with Jeffrey W. Ingram. So you guys do a lot of the exercises, which is amazing. You need to see how to go through the process. He talks a lot about um, his big thing is cultures. He loves cultures, but he and Michael are always uh, fun to listen to. They have a so World Builders Anvil is a podcast. Oh. We should probably have them Sorry, on the podcast. Is that not coaching? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm looking them up. I'm just like how we should, get, we should actually get them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we should. I feel like there's some overlap between our two podcasts that we should <laughs> probably talk about. <laughs> uh, all right, Daniel, you have a question. Go. What is your favorite D&D spell and why? <sighs> Boy. I know it's a hard one. I had to do it. Okay, so... Probably either silent image or rope trick. Yes. Yeah. It's all about the user creativity with those two. That's totally, that totally makes sense. Cause I, for the longest time I've been wanting to play a character who does rope trick and is an assassin. And he just like leaves a pile of stuff at the bottom of the rope. So people come over and look like, what the hell is this? And then sneak attack from above. I've, I've just <laughs> always wanted to do that. <laughs> That's brilliant. Why not combine the two and silent image, uh, like a, a something that is tantalizing, and then rope trick down? Okay, you could do that, but you said one spell, <laughs> so. Oh, <laughs> well, you uh, you yeah. gave us two, so you know we might as well combine the two. <laughs> well, speak speaking of that, though. Okay, what was your favorite character death? We asked this of Morkborg, so I'd be oh. curious to see. <laughs> so it was actually the first character I ever played. Uh, because I couldn't be easy on my GM. I was playing an evil cleric and um, it got to the point where one of the players was leaving and our characters had been antagonistic the whole time. So he tried to kill him, did a crit fail, his sickle that he was wielding slipped out of his hand across the clearing into the gut of another player. Uh, <laughs> and because it was a crit on the hit, the scythes did four times damage and instantly killed that person. <laughs> At which point the rest of the party killed my character. <laughs> <laughs> Were you by... the only evil character? <laughs> uh, yeah, I made that mistake. <laughs> you totally deserve it then. That's fine. Yeah. Death by deserved. <laughs> yeah. All right. And finally, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell people where they can find you? Okay. Well, the best place to find me, because with all of the COVID stuff going on, I pretty much have zero social media presence because it, stresses me the fuck out. Uh, you can find me at crrowenson.com. That's my website and blog. That's probably the best place to find me. Um, you can join my newsletter. I send out weekly newsletters just talking about life, mental health, and, and magic systems. Um, so yeah, that's the best way to get a hold of me is through the website. All right. And Clark, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been a real fucking blast, man. Thank you. Now, I also I, I also understand that you have a book coming out pretty soon. 
Yeah, so it's not a it's not a full book. It is a workbook specifically designed to help people build limitations for their magic systems, because everybody loves Sanderson's law. But if you don't know how to build the limitations, you're not really in a better place. So the whole workbook is designed to walk you through five major areas I get inspiration and use to create them, as well as 15 specific exercises to walk you through the process. So that's coming out September 3rd, and I'm, I'm super excited. <laughs> that's, I'm probably going to purchase that as well. All right. Um, uh, Clark, again, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, that'll be it. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope maybe I could come back sometime. That would be amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's some kind of an open invitation that we have here. For sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you just let me know when you need me to duck out of work on a Thursday and I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the episode. Uh, if you really enjoyed very technical uh, talk about magic systems, the craft of writing, fantasy in general, this is the episode for you. This was a lot of fun, actually. Like, as, as someone who is a big old nerd, this was definitely a really, really fun episode to, to kind of sink my teeth into in a more serious sense. I'm really looking forward to his workbook because I feel like he's onto something in terms of, like, figuring out what's the template for building a magic system. Yes. And again, I cannot emphasize enough how the fuck has this not been a thing earlier? I hope that he fucking explodes from this. I hope that yes. <laughs> he gets incredibly popular and gets a lot of praise for this workbook. I also hope the workbook's good, but yeah. considering how passionately he spoke about this stuff, I'm I'm convinced that it can't be anything but very good. We've had a good trend of people exploding after we talk to them. <laughs> okay, hold on. Are we, we going to claim? Are you uh, claiming? <laughs> you need to clarify that because I'm um, just saying that a lot of people after we talk to them seem to explode in the literally? popular way. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, because otherwise it seems like we're to a lot of people it seems that we're getting these interviews based on sexual favors. Chris. <laughs> oh Jesus, no! Oh, wow. I thought okay. threats would be what we were going for from no. there. But Jesus. Uh, yeah, no. Expl oh, really? Exploding in your mouth and you thought threats, huh? Oh I did not God. say exploding he in your not, mouth. He did not add the words in your mouth. You're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> I'm going to edit around this to make it sound like you said You it. son of a bitch. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's all good stuff. That's just about going to wrap it up for us this week here at World Build with us. And remember that if you want to get your premise or setting on the show, go ahead and shoot us an email at worldbuildwithus at gmail.com or you can go ahead and send us a DM at Let's World Build on the Twitters. Remember that we love you very much and uh, don't explode in our mouths. Uh, <laughs> remember that we love you very much. We're all in this together and we're going to make it until next week.